Aloha. It's December the 2nd, 2021. It's Wednesday, 11 o'clock. I only mean one thing. It's time for What Now, America? I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Welcome, and today's title is China, Russia, Pollute Earth's Orbit. About two weeks ago, Russia sent up a missile and it destroyed one of their satellites in outer space in Earth's orbit. That strike created 1,500 pieces of new debris that circles the planet each, each orbit. Uh, those debris pieces will be potentially in our orbit for decades, if not longer. Uh, when that strike took place, the astronauts in the International Space Station were woken up and told to immediately go into their escape capsule and hide out there for two to three hours in the event that uh, some of that new debris field would uh, either penetrate the space station or damage it severely. Fortunately, that didn't occur. The point is, Russia knows very well that there is agreements between Russia, China, the United States, that number one, uh, creating new space debris in outer space in our Earth's orbit is um, forbidden. And secondly, China knows that they're not supposed to weaponize their satellites with missiles, specifically hypersonic missiles. So the question is right now is, um, we have over 27,000 pieces of debris. But the big issue is we have thousands of satellites, technologies that we rely on each and every day that you know, we didn't have in the 1960s that make our lives better. All this technology te potentially is in jeopardy from all the space debris. Yet Russia abandons their, uh, the international agreements and decides to create more debris. The United States uh, response was this was reckless, but that's the only response they received that was reckless. So here to talk about this issue of space debris, our technology in, in, in Earth's orbit, and the bigger picture, connect the dots, is what's really going on. And with me to discuss this is Jay Fidel and Winston Welch. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, Tim. You know, Jay, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, United States and Russia and China were uh, blasting off nukes in open air environments, spreading radioactivity across the globe, depending on weather patterns. Uh, we now have um, basically Russia blasting their satellites, creating all sorts of space debris. By the way, um, one piece of space debris can travel at 17,500 miles per hour. A paint fleck can actually go through the International Space Station and create a hole. That's how fast these pieces move in, in orbit. Um, yet Russia is completely ignoring that. And so what are the implications of our existing technology in space? All the satellites and all the countries that sent up uh, now put in jeopardy by over 27,000 pieces of debris. Uh, what should we tell Russia? Because they obviously did this without a second thought. What should the nations, what should the world be sending the message to Russia as to knock it off? I don't think Russia cares what the world says. Uh, I wish there were an easier solution. Um, you know, and our sanctions haven't been pr productive either. Um, I don't know what they want. Uh, they they want they want to be uh, naughty. They they want to be a mischievous country. They want to be rogue is what they want to be. Their economies is not uh, is not that great. It's not that big. What did somebody say? It was the size of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> there are other similarities, I might add. Um, anyway, uh, you know, we're, we're in a cold war with Russia. You know, uh, th this morning, the uh, FBI uh, rounded up a whole bunch of people. Or I don't know if they rounded them up, but they identified a whole bunch of people uh, in Russia that were um, involved in the uh, ransomware uh, initiative, you know, and, and they have made hundreds of millions of dollars doing ransomware in American companies. Are, are we doing that to them? Uh, I, you know, I don't care what the government tells me on this. I don't believe we are doing that to them. I don't believe we have the, uh, the power to uh, fight with them at that level, uh, nor the will. So, you know, what's happening is they're having their way with us. Sure, they knew this was going to make a mess in space. Um, but they want to be rogue and they, they also want to, you know, control space for their own purposes. I think this is a control point, what it is. Um, it's another story with, with China. It's just different. But Russia is such a rogue and, and we are not stopping them in any way. Watch what happens in the Ukraine. 
Um, watch what happens, um, you know, in the internet. Watch what happens in the election. Well, I wanted to talk about the specifics of Ukraine because I do see correlations. I guess the question is, do you see a correlation to this blatant um, violation of an agreement with, with all the nations that have technologies in, in outer space and their, their indifference and their troop buildup along the uh, Ukraine border? 100,000 troops are, are now positioned, uh, poised potentially to invade Ukraine. Is there any correlations to these two actions? Oh, sure. It's the rogue thing. They don't follow agreements. They do what they want to do. And remember that there's no international body that can stop them because they sit on the Security Council and they can veto anything in the United Nations. So this is really, in terms of a global process, it's out of control. And Joe Biden you know, can talk to uh, Vladimir Putin, have a nice uh, conversation with him. It isn't going to stop him from doing what he does. I mean, he knew uh, about the ransomware. He knows about all that hacking. Um, you know, he knows uh, he knows all the things that Russia does because he controls it. He's a dictator. Uh, and on top of that, he's knocking off any possibility of a democratic election. Uh, Navalny's still in jail. And they, the other guy who was trying to run against uh, Putin, some, uh, he was uh, his party was disbanded by government action. They disbanded his political party two days ago. So, I mean, what's happening is, uh, is he is emerging as a, a more mischievous dictator than, than before. And we're threatening to Western Europe. And remember, Gazprom, he controls the um, natural gas into Western Europe. Um, he's, trying to be, um, uh, he's trying to be more powerful than he should be. And there's nothing that Europe will do, nothing that we will do, we're standing by. And this goes to uh, not only his attitude and, and Russia's attitude as a, you know, as a government, but it goes to the American attitude in terms of dealing with them. Surely there's something we can do, because over time, this is so corrosive to our standing in the world, to our role in the, in the global society. Uh, we look more powerless every day. Now, it's not just Russia. But Russia is a major contributor to our um, image in the world these days. And this is part of it. Right. Um, Winston, President uh, Bush, Bush, President Biden's Secretary of State, I don't know where Bush came from, but it did. Um, <clears throat> he said that, um, you know, not only did this blast of a missile have serious consequences, but what does that mean? I mean, what is the, the, the stick that the United States or its allies can bring out against either Russia or China um, to prevent this kind of um, weaponizing space, if you will? I mean, there's an agreement that we're not putting missiles in space, yet here, here China sends off a hypersonic missile from one of their satellites, and um, you know, it, it hits its target in, in Earth, uh, on Earth. What consequences can the United States or its allies possibly implement to stop this kind of behavior and the continuation of blowing more satellites up and creating more space debris, or worse yet, the invasion of Ukraine? It just seems like Jay's right. I mean, uh, Russia doesn't care, and it seems to do whatever it wants, like a, um, a wayward child. Well, it's, it's uh, you know, from the Russians, I, I was watching The Crown, and someone on there says, uh, you know, the Americans are new to the field and Russia needs to be treated as a, uh, as a great power that it is. And I, I, I back this, of course, this is set in the 50s um, and uh, some kerfluffle with uh, I, I, and right after that was the Suez crisis. You know, the, I, I think when you're when you've got satellites, remember, and, and then they have the Sputnik going up in that same show. And this changed apparently the entire world at the moment, thinking there's a Russian satellite above our heads and, and a consciousness changed at that time. Well, I've come back here 50 plus 60 years later, and we have uh, what NASA says, 20,000 tracked pieces of debris. We've got, however, 500,000 maybe of the size of a marble that they can't even uh, track. A lot of these things, you know, they're, they're coming down to the earth at incredible velocities. Nobody has an interest in having this space junk up there. I think Russian scientists uh, understand this, that their satellites are just as vulnerable as ours are if a piece of uh, debris hits them. Um, 
as do the Chinese. Nobody needs their satellites being taken out by a, a collision with a piece of space junk. And yet that's where we're kind of at uh, or, or might find ourselves. Um, there was a movie with Sandra Bullock uh, in it that, that exactly addressed this thing. So uh, that threat to the astronauts and cosmonauts and uh, I don't know what the Chinese astronauts are called, Sinonauts, or, um, but it, this is real. Uh, however, Ukraine seems a lot more real to me. So does Taiwan. Uh, on the ground for uh, on the ground for us mortals who don't get the chance to jet out into space much, um, and you think about this. I, I saw there were three large American ships that went into Taiwan Strait just this week or last week, and we think about that. This would be like, um, uh, you know, it, it's interesting that America still sails right there. NATO is right on the border of of, of Russia right now with a. Uh, the, the Baltic states. And so Russia feels this, this sense like probably America did in with Cuba and the Russian missile crisis, that this, this power is right on our doorstep and they don't like that feeling of being bullied or intimidated. So they're going to lash out in other ways as, and they can do it in many other ways because they are in, in essence. In, uh, you know, you raise a good point for, because um, Putin said one of the reasons he's had a troop build up in the Ukraine border is he wants a, a firm standard agreement from NATO nations that all eastward expansion and weapon systems will not place. He's, uh, he's so you're, you're, you're dead on. I mean, he recently, I think he said that today and that uh, he has no intentions of withdrawing the, the 100,000 troops from the border until he gets such agreements from NATO. So um, good point, very good point. Well, and, and, and you know, however, we've learned that, you know, you can't play placate a dictator. Um, uh, it, it just doesn't happen. They want more. However, if you look at, at, at Ukraine, I think the eastern portion of it is predominantly Russian speaking. And uh, he's also, I think, feels that Belarus and, and, and Ukraine are natural sort of parts of Russia, as it were, and, and has always wanted to, I think, really recreate the um, power, prestige, influence of the, the Soviet Union, uh, as it were, it's, you know, obviously, you know, that sounds eerily similar to Hitler saying that Austria was a, a German speaking nation, and therefore it was only a natural inclination to, to absorb them. Uh, I know that Putin says that about the Ukraine, and that was his basis for Crimea, the invasion and takeover of Crimea. And nothing happened there. We didn't nothing do happened, right. We, we didn't do anything. And so why were people in Ukraine? And uh, I would probably be looking at moving west or, or pulling out. But, I, I, you know, that it, it's interesting you bring up Austria, because after the war, it was the only country where the four great powers occupied it and then pulled out. Um, they didn't do it for Germany, but they did for Austria. Maybe, maybe something like this could happen in Ukraine. I wouldn't trust Putin at all. However, um, if they could declare that this 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 uh, the Ukraine be a uh, a neutral zone, as it were. That would be wouldn't be an if if people could be trusted for that. Um, I don't know that we're there. So uh, it, right now, if I were in, in Ukraine, I'd I'd be um, having a look behind my back, uh, or at least to the east. Yeah, Jay, kind of the same question to you. And you know, the United States seems to be taking a Neville Chamberlain type of approach that. We wag our finger at Russia or China saying there'll be serious consequences, either economic or otherwise. Um, same question to you. What, what does the United States have as far as a stick to really deter Russia from doing whatever it thinks it, it wants to, either be creating new space junk in outer space or a uh, potential invasion of uh, Ukraine or, or the continuation of hacking in um, United States computers? You know, I, I have to answer that with nothing. We don't have anything. <clears throat> and if we had something, we wouldn't use it because of the, the nationalistic tone of the country. I mean, more, more than just the Trumpers feel that we ought to avoid foreign wars and entanglements. We're in an isolation mode. We had a bad time in, in Afghanistan and, and, for that matter, Iraq. We didn't achieve anything. We undermined our, ourselves. We stepped on our own toes. People are not going to support an initiative um, that goes to, for an overseas adventure. 
and it would take an overseas adventure. It would take some, you know, what do you call it, aggressive steps. Uh, I mean, I, and I think in, on the question of whether um, we can hack them the way they hack us, I, I get two reactions I would offer on that one. Number one is I'm not sure we do have the capability. You know, everybody says, oh, don't worry. You know, we got, we got gizmos and secrets and software and hacking capabilities, and we haven't even trotted them out. We have everything they have and more. I'm really not sure about that at all. I think that's overblown American exceptionalism, which is non-existent. <clears throat> the, other, the other part of it is if we did that, if we did that to say Russia or China, we'd get a response, wouldn't we? And I think it's fair to say they have the ability to hack our utility companies, our telecommunications, our water, our, you know, our, our facilities, our infrastructure right now, which is thin anyway and behind, including the software that runs it, it's behind. And we're, we're not gonna pass the BBB bill as much as uh, you know, both, both, all three of us would like to see that happen. So we're not gonna do anything daring um, if we could, and it's not clear we could. Also, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's a matter of um, whether, it's just a matter of when uh, Putin uh, makes his move on Ukraine. Um, you know, you never heard of the Tonkin Gulf. You never heard of Remember the Maine. You never heard of a, 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 a made up provocation, tail wagging the dog. Uh, he could create that any Tuesday. Uh, and my guess is that he will. He'll create something that is a phony provocation to those 100,000 troops on the border, and in they go. What's, what's, what's interesting, though, is that Ukraine is a real country. Ukraine is a government, a prime minister, a certain level of freedom of the press. Ukraine is, um, you know, it is a Western country of sorts. And uh, if, it, if it disappears, it'll be a, a great tragedy. But I'm not sure the people in Ukraine are are ready for a fight. They, you know, they're treating life and daily activities, um, you know, as, you know, normal. Um, they don't, they, you, somebody said they look over their shoulder. Maybe they should be looking over their shoulder, but really I, I do have some contact with Ukraine. Um, they're kind of ignoring the issue. Mm -hmm. um, maybe because ignoring it is the best way to deal with it. Well, clearly and, there's a- Ukraine is in great jeopardy right now. So clearly there's some pressure in the tank here and that needs to be relieved. Um, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken will meet this week with his counterpart from Russia, Sergei Lavrinov. Um, any high hopes that something will be resolved as far as the troop buildups, um, either along Ukraine or uh, a firm agreement that uh, blowing up missiles, or excuse me, blowing up satellites in outer space uh, will curtail and, and stop? Any, any, any progress uh, projected for this meeting between Blinken and Lavrov? Well, let me approach that by saying, does, does Russia care about climate change? They didn't show up at COP26. Uh, <clears throat> this move on, on space is uh, another way of despoiling the environment. Um, th I don't think they really care. They're not doing anything about climate change in their country. Um, you know, dictators don't care. They care about money well, and power. You know, let's let's examine that, Jay. I mean, they have hundreds and hundreds of satellites circling Earth's orbit. Uh, you know, the, a piece of debris doesn't distinguish between an American flag and a Russian flag. Oh, I, I, mean, I just they rely they on their technologies. They, they just don't care. <clears throat> and and uh, you know, so what? They screw up the satellites for the whole world. They don't care, and and we could suffer. That's just another element of a declining world order. Okay, well, that, then I go to the question. Well, let me go to answer don't... your question. Okay, go ahead. So I'm Tony Blinken, and I'm with the uh, my counterpart in in this meeting with Russia. What's what's exactly in my toolkit? Well, let's see. You guys got to stop that. You got to work with us to protect the world and all the people in the world. You got to be good guys, and and the Russian guys. Ha! Ah, you really, we don't care about being good guys. We care about advancing our own interests. You can advance yours and we can advance ours. What I'm saying is that Tony could threaten sanctions, which are you know, not really effective. We know that. Um, Tony can stamp his feet. What, what is in Tony's toolkit? Winston is a brilliant guy. Maybe he has an answer, but I sure don't. Okay, what if it's not just the United States and 
the um, paper tiger veiled threats that we sometimes wave in front of China or wave in front of the, uh, Russia? What if all of NATO and all the other nations that have an interest in preserving their technologies in outer space say, we got to step up to the plate with the United States and not have the United States be our only mouthpiece out there? What's the, what the chances really of that good, happening? That's a really good point. And that would be something that Tony Blinken could do. Um, he could, you know, try to develop some allies in the EU. Our reputation in the EU is not sterling after Trump. In fact, not sterling by virtue of things that Biden has done and not done. Um, so he may not have all that much leverage, but it would be great if he could establish some kind of coalition uh, among the countries in the EU. So when he goes to speak to his counterpart in Russia, he's not just alone, because alone we don't have a lot of clout. Together we have more clout. And the same goes, uh, you know, in, for Asia and for China. Um, we have to develop uh, alliances and coalitions and multilateral arrangements so that when we speak, we speak with a bigger stick. Okay. Winston, uh, earlier on, Jay mentioned the Sput Sputnik uh, moment that took place and scared the hell out of Americans because here is a Russian technology satelliting, you know, uh, circling the earth. Uh, didn't we have a, a Sputnik moment a couple uh, last month, early this month, when China set off its hypersonic missile from one of their satellites? And it just seems like the media really didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. It was a one day uh, news event. Uh, certainly didn't get the attention that Sputnik did back in 1950s, early 1950s. Um, why do you think that is? Why do you think that became a non event where we actually have? proven the weaponization of outer space and yet nearly a ripple in, in concern or reporting from the media. Because it was two minutes ago and we can't focus on anything but the bright shiny object in front of us as well. How many decades have we had mutually assured destruction, right? This is, we've had this sort of Damocles over our head our entire our entire lives. We've never known a time when we couldn't have a reign of, 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 of a cataclysmic, you know, warfare exchange in 15 minutes. As we experienced here in Hawaii, you remember a couple of years ago when we had the uh, warning inbound, you know, nuclear missile, this is not a drill. That was, it was an interesting moment. I don't know if you were awake for that or, or were here, but I just thought, oh, so there's an incoming ballistic missile where do I seek a shelter from that? Okay. Um, it's part of that. We have massive military industrial complex that needs to feed itself. So does China, so does Russia. But what is, I think, interesting here is that we're, we need to take the deeper dive with both of these nations, with all nations. America's been spectacular at expanding its reach and influence over the this last century, but especially since the war, we have raised and helped raise standard of living around the world, uh, levels of uh, education and sophistication. Are all of these countries our friends or allies or share in our interest? No, but I think the continued message here is we need to engage more deeply with all of these nations. We need to find our commonality just the same way that we do inside of our own nation. We need to find out where do we stand on common ground? How do we work on these problems together when we can and where we can together? That's the only chance we have as a species, let alone, um, the, you know, like COP26, COP was it, uh, Jay? What, what do the Russians export? They export oil. Are the Germans going to squawk? No, because Nord, too, just got the, uh, the, the green light from the, the, the Biden administration. These people have a dance to do with each other. They're going to do their dance. It's in no one's interest to inflame or poke or prod the other one. There's been these simmering things and the issues that are still there that are, that are going to uh, also be after this administration. The main thing is keep on engaging, keep on talking, lower the temperature, more baking soda all the way around domestically and internationally as we engage more deeply and find our common humanity and what we're gonna do about the really interesting problems that, uh, that face us. Uh, you sound just like Neville Chamberlain. A little bit, maybe, to uh, your average Joe, but honestly, it's gotten us where we Neville are right Neville Chamberlain now. did not work. He said, speak strong, uh, uh, who said speak softly? Roosevelt, Teddy. Teddy. 
petty, but those days, what are we going to do? Are we going to, we're going to send a, 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 you know, a million troops to uh, defend Ukraine? It's not going to happen. Well, that was my question. What does the nation, what does the allies of the United States, what do we do to curtail um, weaponization in space and invasions of Ukraine or, or Taiwan? What is, what is the solution? I think Jay's, Jay's comment of nothing is, he says nothing's going to happen, but I think what I'm suggesting is deeper engagement, deeper involvement, deeper connections of our economies so that these- What, what I'm suggesting, just unthinkable. to be clear, what I'm suggesting is the United States cannot do any of that alone. We have to bring our friends into the ball game, and we are not doing that. We have to have coalitions and, um, you know, we have to have uh, associations and arrangements with as many countries as we can so that when we talk nice like this, we're talking with the big stick of half the world. Yeah, what is the big yeah, we're stick? We're not doing that. We lost ground in Trump and we're not gaining it back yet. What is the big stick? What does the big stick look like? What could we do? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, you, we've heard for 50 years economic sanctions. What does that look like? If I'm the United States and I put economic sanctions on Russia or China, it doesn't mean that much, I'm sorry, or tariffs. But if I'm the United States and I have uh, 50 or 100 countries who will act with me uh, in uh, sanctions, maybe the wrong word, but, you know, boycott. Um, then maybe I have some clout. I have the power of embarrassment in the press, and I have the power of, um, of, the, of the group. And if I could achieve that, there would be some, some twist, some leverage. Unfortunately, I, I don't think our State Department is doing that, or at least it's not doing that to, you know, in, in any great degree. Um, but, but to answer the question in the room here, that's what I think we have in our, our kit. Our inventory is the possibility of doing that. <clears throat> we were very powerful after World War II because we won the war and because we had a lot of countries who were with us. The number of allies we had were all the you know, uh, anti-Axis powers. That's a lot of people. <clears throat> and we had that to support us. Unfortunately, we don't have it now, but we could build it again. We ought to start building it right away today. All right, we've run out of time. Um, Winston, would you like to address uh, Jay's recent comments or do you have any last thoughts, uh, closing remarks? Uh, today's December 1st, not the 2nd. So it's World AIDS Day. So uh, we remember all those afflicted by HIV and AIDS. Uh, the other- I better get a new calendar. Hey, and you know what? This is one of those things that we got to, to do together. We've all experienced COVID together as a planetary society. This is what I'm aiming at, Jay, is this, this idea that we have serious problems on a planetary scale that we can start looking at together. Our satellites going down? Okay. But uh, we've got real, real issues here and a sustained, continued involvement on our shared humanity I think does have wheels and it's not about placating or or indulging it's about calling people out and as we know ourselves we've fallen on the democracy index so uh you know gathering a, a coalition of willing democratic nations uh is a great place to begin and we need to strengthen our own institutions at home uh as well as pointing the finger at those uh, who are below us and that's where i think we can continue to head rather than uh you know apocalyptic scenarios Let's look towards a brighter future because the, the, the alternative is grim. Let's face it. I need you to be here, Winston, for that, that precious balance that you bring to the show and the, and the conversation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Jay, counterpoint? Yeah, two things. One is, um, you know, it, the calling out part is important, um, but we should not rely on the media to do that. Uh, the media is sometimes dead wrong and they follow each other. You know, the original news comes from only a couple of media in the country. The rest just follow. And sometimes, and there was an example of that yesterday on MSNBC, where they had a number of, a number of their guests were blaming Biden for Omicron. I said, what? What is this? Well, you know, they try to fabricate news right in front of us. And this is my favorite channel doing this. My point is that you can't count on the media to keep it straight. 
Um, and, and, and I think that's going to be the case going forward. You have to count on government, at least for part of this work, the work we're talking about, the work in dealing and correcting and, and being a moral leader. You have to count on government. And the problem is right now, government in this country is in shambles. I mean, uh, you sent an email around, Tim, about these women, about Bo Bobert in Congress. She's like 11 years old, maybe nine years old. No common sense, no education, no scruples, no nothing. A child, an out of control child making a mess all over the floor. And this is what we have in Congress. These are our leaders who we rely on to make public policy, to lead a government in a very difficult and arguably declining world. You know, we are in deep kimchi nationally. And to go back to my point a little while ago is that if we are going to be a global leader, if we are going to create collaboration around us and deal with these bad actors, we're going to have to, you said it, Tim, we're going to have to clean house. We're going to have to make a government that works. And frankly, we are a long way from that. And the distance is getting greater between us and rational government. This morning, you must have heard it live. Um, there was the uh, argument in the Supreme Court. I am on Roe v. Wade. I am not optimistic about that either. Uh, and and the, my final comment would be, was one guy who lost his son in one of these school shootings. And he said, it's quite remarkable uh, that um, the Supreme Court is so concerned about life in the womb. Uh, what about life on the streets? What about 100,000 people, young people, who have been shot and killed with guns that Congress could have stopped a long time ago? We have it upside down. And hey, that's the way it is. Well, put the correlation back to the ineffectiveness of government and your comments about the ineffective, ineffectiveness of government. Jay, you get the last word for December the 1st, and I emphasize December 1st, not December 2nd. I'd like to thank you, Jay Fidel, Winston Welch, for joining us this morning for What Now America? Join us next Wednesday at 11 o'clock for a new topic and a new discussion. And until then, aloha. <laughs>